Have y'all come hungry? Yes. Not physically. Spiritually hungry. I read something the other day. If you are not hungry to study and get in this word, you need to check if you're a believer. A believer in Jesus Christ is a new creation. They should be hungry to get into this word. It should not seem dull. It should not seem boring. Now, if you need, all of us need help many times in understanding. That's why you have the Holy Spirit ask him to illumine things to you. So we want to get into our lesson today. We've been on this journey with Rebecca forever. Is the teacher ever going to get off of it? I don't know, because the Holy Spirit keeps bringing things to my heart and my mind. Well, you need to talk about this before she meets Isaac, the bridegroom, before she becomes the bride. Remember, is she on a really long journey? Yeah, it's 500 miles. She's on a camel, and she's following. She had to be willing to follow the leading of the unnamed servant, who I believe is a type of the Holy Spirit. So she's got to follow him, and we're not told much about the journey except she was willing, and all of a sudden they're there, and she says, who is that guy? And he said, that's the heir. That's Isaac. And she gets off the camel, and they get married. So, but we're, we're filling in. What happened on this journey? We're filling in, because it is the journey, it is the walk of sanctification where we all become more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So today, we are told that we are to walk worthy. Well, what does that mean? That's the purpose of the lesson. We have a high calling. You and I have a high calling from God himself. And he says you need to walk worthy. Now, you and I, when we are born again, do we have a brand new identity in Jesus Christ? Yes, brand new, and we have to become the person that we are in Christ. So we have a high calling, and we have to become obedient to the walk of sanctification that only the Holy Spirit can do in us and through us. Second Corinthians 5.17, we all know this scripture. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. New creature. Everything of my old man is passed away. It is supposed to be. And then all things are to become new. So my new identity in Christ, go back to your day of salvation when you applied the blood to your life and to your heart. First and foremost, you are to be a new person. That old person that you were is supposed to be gone. That's right, supposed to be. Now, I have listed for you your identity in Christ. These are many things that we are. What do we have because we are in Christ? I'm going to quickly go through them, but I'm not going to announce the reference. You are no longer a slave to sin. No longer. You're reconciled to God. You're no longer a citizen of this world, but you are now apart from it. I live in it, but I'm not part of it. I have a new place, a new citizenship in heaven. Things of the world should no longer draw you. That's a tough one. Things of the world should no longer draw us in. Next, we don't fear or overemphasize suffering on earth or the trials we face. Because now, of what we've learned in the last few weeks, when trials and tribulations come in my life, even a dark valley, what do I say? I've been expecting you. Remember our little raccoon? I've been expecting you. They don't take us by surprise. We're learning how to react, aren't we? Because we have, you have a list a few weeks ago, our attitude verses. We're supposed to rejoice in them because he's using those to test our faith, to prove its genuineness. He is trying to transform us to the image of Christ. So we know how to react now. We do not place importance on things the world values. We reflect my mind is no longer conformed to this world. I have a command for my mind to be renewed. And it's renewed in God's word. We are now an instrument of righteousness to God. My enemy is not the people around me. Boy, that was a hard one for me to learn. There's some people out there that I thought were the enemy, just like my daughter. 
I thought she was the enemy. God reminded me, her rebellion is not against you. The rebellion of a prodigal is against God himself. So, anyway, it changed the way I thought about her. Our enemy is not the people around us, but spiritual warfare. I think we forget day by day, living our life day by day, there is spiritual warfare going on constantly in the heavenlies. Always. And they are trying to keep people from knowing God. And the last one, we are given God's grace to grow into spiritual maturity that will reflect my new identity. He is the only one that can grow me, but he commands me to be conformed into the image of Christ. But then he gives me what I need to be obedient to the command. So this new man, how do we relate to Jesus Christ? What is the difference in the death of Jesus Christ and the death of many others that people follow and say this is their God? He's alive. The resurrection is the difference. He's the only one that was raised from the dead. So how do I relate to him? I look at him. It's the resurrected life of Jesus Christ that now lives within each one of us if you have the Holy Spirit living in you. Colossians 3, 1 says, If you then be risen with Christ, you are to set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. When he arose from the dead, did he take where the grave clothes out? No. Remember when John and Peter went to go into the tomb? What's lying there? The grave clothes are there. You don't need them anymore. He had entered Jesus Christ himself, now had a glorious resurrected life. You don't need grave clothes anymore. We go to the story of Lazarus. Remember, he was dead. And so he's bound uh, with the grave clothes. And so Jesus yelled, he didn't yell, he said loudly, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead, this is Lazarus, came forth. He's bound hand and foot. They wrapped him like a mummy. He's bound hand and foot. His face is bound about with a napkin. Jesus said to the grave clothes, loose him and let him go. You don't need him anymore. Because those grave clothes represent my old life with its sinful deeds. And he, when we are born again, he says, loose him. Let him go, because you no longer are bound by those grave clothes. Now that I have a new life in Christ, he says, you're going to walk in this new life. You're going to learn to put off the old deeds and put, off the new, put on the new. <coughs> Sorry. We do this by practicing our position in Christ. Who am I in Christ? A lot of things, right? I've given you a brochure several, maybe a couple of years ago. So let's say this line up here is who you are in Christ. Am I blameless? I am in Christ. Think about your position in Christ. Does he see me just like he sees Jesus Christ? Robe of righteousness. So these are all the things I am in Jesus Christ. Now, I practice that position because I keep reckoning on this to be true. But yet, is our everyday life kind of like this? Always. And so I've told y'all a prayer that I have. You know, I'm visual. So you can hold your hand up. This is who I am in Christ. This is who he wants me to be. And may by the power of the Holy Spirit, may my life every day be lived ever closer to who I am in Christ. Because many of us live like who we were. And that, that flares up on us sometimes at the moment we don't even expect it. And so I want to live closer to the reality of who I really am in Christ. I want to be dead to the old, and I want to be alive to the new. But that doesn't happen 24-7. But as you're growing in Christ, it should be happening more and more. Now that I had that new life in Christ, I have to walk in a new life. So I'm going to put off those old deeds and desires. Colossians 3, 9, and 10. And you can see my graphic up here, the guy in the middle. He's throwing off the old man. And we have new clothes to put on. J. Vernon McGee did a sermon on how to be a well-dressed Christian. Very interesting because we have new clothes to put on. 
And he says, you take off your old self with its practices, you put on their new self, and my new self is being renewed day by day as I get in the Word and surrender to the Holy Spirit back into the image of the Creator. When God created Adam and Eve, did he take Eve out of the body of Adam to make his bride? Were they going to rule and have dominion? They were, but they lost it. Okay, everything that God purposed in Genesis is going to be fulfilled in his millennial kingdom. So Jesus Christ is Adam number two. Is he already been told, has he been promised a kingdom where he will rule and reign? Is he to have a bride that's going to rule and reign with him? He is. But you know how what I've been teaching, and I'm reminding you, it's a thought. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting closer to my thought, and I think next week's lesson will show why I'm really thinking it. That I'm thinking that his bride, Christ's bride, will be taken out of the body just like Adam number one. He had a body, but his bride was not all of his body. It was part of it. And I believe being the bride of Christ is one of the highest callings that we have. And I also know by studying God's word, the rewards, the crowns, all of the privileges will not be the same for every person that's a believer. Because we have believers in all stages. From kind of a lukewarm till we have somebody like Paul the Apostle. So I'm getting, I'm getting there and really praying and asking God to show me I'm not ready to say where I stand yet. Okay, the Greek verbs translated put off and put on indicate a once for all action. I'm supposed to have put off and now I put on. When I trust Jesus Christ, I put off the old life and put on the new because my old man has been what? He's buried. My new man is now supposed to be in control, but who is the new man? It's the life of Jesus Christ. It's the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. He's supposed to be in control. But notice the word renew is a present participle. I'm constantly being renewed. Constantly. It is an ongoing process. In Romans 8, 28, all of you know the scripture. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Remember when you're reading the Bible, slow down. Read every word, okay? Now go on to the next verse because he's going to tell us the purpose. He says, for whom he foreknew... I believe God had foreknowledge and based his choices on foreknowledge. For whom he foreknew, he predestined. I do not believe that God predestined one person to go to hell. I don't believe it. I think it goes against the character of God. Here is what he predestined people to. The believers to be conformed to the image of his son. That's one of the things he predestined us to that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, let's not stop, and let's go to verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, those that he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, he called them. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he glorified. What's missing? Sanctification. Because... When I am born again, is it all in the finished work of Jesus Christ that he justifies me and sees me with the robe of righteousness of Christ? Is he going to do all the work to give me the glorification and the glorified body? What is being worked on right now in this life? My soul. My spirit's born again. My body's going to be glorified, but my soul. This is who I am. It's my mind, my will, my emotions, your personality. Is it being saved day by day? That's what is being saved day by day. Now, he says, I justified, I'm going to glorify. But sanctification, 
takes our cooperation. It is not an automatic thing. You're not justified and all of a sudden you are sanctified into the image of Christ. It is a process. So in 1 Thessalonians 4.1, we're going to see the word worthy again. He says, walk worthy. So we're talking about our walk of sanctification, that journey that we're on with Rebecca. But in verse 3, he says, you want to know the will of God for you? It is clear as a bell. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification. That's to each one of us who has been born again. And it's me learning to be obedient. It's a lifelong call. It's a lifelong process. From the day you're born again until your last breath, you are in the process of being sanctified, which is being made into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I have been on this journey, and I have a review of our lessons, the titles of them, so we can see since Rebecca left about four months ago. See, we're getting closer. Since she left about four months ago, we learned, man, there's a danger in delayed obedience. Remember when she was said, I will go, and he got up the next morning, and the He's ready to take her and start the journey. And her family says, oh, let her delay for 10 days. He said, no, there is a danger for you and I to be born again and then not submit to sanctification, delayed obedience. But then we went to chapter 12 of Hebrews and we got encouraged in this race, in this walk of faith, in this race of faith. I got encouraged in Hebrews 12. But then I got down to about verse 17 and oh, Esau pops in. In Esau, we learn you can fall short of the grace of God. And what did he do? He lost his inheritance because he, think it, he thought it had no value. He thought it was worthless. So when he is faint and weary, those are the two words used. When he's faint and weary, he says, I will give up my birthright. I'll give up my inheritance. I don't care a thing about it because I'm so hungry. All I want is that bowl of soup or whatever it was, lentils. There's a danger because if I stay under the umbrella of God's grace, he, gives, he energizes me. He gives me what I need and I don't get faint and weary, right? So if I get faint and weary, I'm out here out from under his umbrella of grace. And so I'm talking about my inheritance. I'm talking about I need an obedient life, to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And if I'm out here on my own, it's not going to happen. Because you and I cannot be transformed in the image of Christ on our own. Right? Okay. Next, we learned that salt is vital in this journey. And salt is I have to have the risen life of Jesus Christ in me. It's his risen life. Then in, I, we had a lesson on this journey, Rebecca, all of us. You're going to be called to suffer. And we learned our attitude versus why do we have to suffer? And we learned what we can learn from that. And then we learned journey begins, but danger awaits. They weren't even hardly past the Red Sea. They weren't even to Mount Sinai yet. And who was waiting to destroy them and keep them from going on the journey? Amalek, who's a type of our flesh. It's our old man. So you make a new commitment. I did this many times. Sit down on Monday morning, because remember, you always start on Monday. So you start on Monday morning, you get your Bible out, your pen, your journal and everything. This time I am going to stick with it. This is going to work. And the minute you do that, who rises up? Your flesh, your old man. He's probably one of your worst enemies. He's strong and he rises up. Amalek traveled two to 300 miles from Canaan to go down where they were and he destroyed and destroyed some of them. And he hit the faint and the weary. We get our strength in Jesus Christ. And then we had a lesson, well, the journey's continuing and I'm supposed to start feasting on unleavened bread. When they were born again, when they put the, the blood on the uh, doorpost and they killed the lamb and did all that, when were they supposed to start feasting on the lamb? Immediately. See, no delay. You start feasting. And they were told, you feast on the unleavened bread, that is the lamb, which is Jesus Christ for you and me. 
Then we had a lesson, but you've got to have discipleship. You, we t were told your loins have to be girded. You have to have shoes on your feet. And you eat the head, you eat the legs, you eat the insides. And we went all through that. Last week, on our journey, we're going to encounter a staff that will break us. Every one of us needs some kind of a staff, just like Jacob had, to break us. Because, as Spurgeon says, God cannot use anybody greatly until he first breaks him. He is going to bring all of us to a place of brokenness and submission before him. So today, we're going to walk worthy and see what that means, because we have a high calling. So we're going to be in the book of Ephesians quite a bit today. And verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I therefore. Now we're going to have to go back and see why it is there for. You always go back. He says, I therefore, I beseech you, I urge you, I beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You and I have been called by God himself to be conformed into the image of his son. That's one thing. We have several others. And Paul says you need to walk worthy of that. My practical living. Here's my position. And he says your practical living, your everyday life, has to come up and match this. What you, in other words, what I say, my walk needs to match it. You have to walk the talk, in other words. Now, in chapter uh, 2 of 1 Thessalonians... Paul also, he goes to that church and he's exhorting them, he's encouraging them, he's charging them. He says, walk in a manner worthy, there's that word again, of the God, he's calling you into his own kingdom and he's calling you into his glory. See, you're called to several different things. And Paul says you've got to walk worthy of that, of that calling. And then he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, as you have received of us how you ought to walk. He tells us, if you start reading the letters of Paul, almost all of his letters are about our walk. Almost all of them. We need to dig into the letters of Paul because he's going to tell us and exhort us how we should live and how we should walk in this life. How you should please God so you would abound more and more. This is Colossians 1, 9 is one of my favorite passages. This is a passage I've committed to memory, and this is a passage that I pray for myself several times a week. It's a great prayer. Paul said to that church at Colossae, since the day we heard of it, now the, the day of your faith, the day of your salvation, he says, we do not cease to pray for you, and we desire... Here's what you can pray to the Lord for yourself. I desire to be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? So that I can walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, that I would be fruitful in every good work, and I would be increasing in the knowledge of God. That's a great prayer to pray for anyone yourself included. Notice we have the phrase again, walk worthy of the Lord. So our walk, it's to be in a manner worthy, worthy of our calling, worthy of God, worthy of the Lord. He talks about our calling, about pleasing God, pleasing the Lord. This is our worthy walk. He repeats it over and over. So this passage in, first, in Colossians 1, that you will walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, and that you would be fruitful in all of your works and increase in the knowledge of God. People should see in us bearing fruit, that fruit is being born in our lives, and also that we're increasing in our knowledge of the Word and our understanding of it. That's what he's saying. So this walk is not passive. I don't just sit down in my chair and say, Okay, God. I'm ready for you to just do all this in me. That's not how it works. The walk is active. There are things that I have to be doing to cooperate. Nobody can walk this for me. Man, aren't there many of us that would love to walk it for our children? 
if we could, but they have to do their own. Nobody can make decisions for me. Nobody gets alone with God for me. Nobody fights against the lust of my mind for me. Growth in the Christian life is my responsibility. God says, I've given you everything that you need, but you have to put yourself in the place for him to do the work, surrendered to him. God the Holy Spirit does the work in us, but I have to do my part to walk in a manner worthy. Now, if I follow his leading and guiding and I'm on the potter's wheel and I'm keeping my vessel clean, will my walk be worthy? Yes, because I'm doing it according to what he says and I'm being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Philippians 2 tells us this. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence... So Paul, they were obeying while Paul's there. But he doesn't want them to not follow that just because he leaves. You know, while the cat's away, the mice will play. No, he says, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence if I'm not there with you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Have you come to a a point in your life where you know that God has put within you the desire to be obedient, the desire to grow, the desire to learn? He puts that in there. And then you have to respond. Work out your own salvation. This is from uh, Wearsby's commentary. It does not suggest that you're working for your salvation. We know that it goes against everything that's taught in God's word. We don't work for our salvation. Because is Paul writing to believers? Yes, he's writing to believers. So that's not what this is about. Work out means you work to full completion, like working out a problem in math. Now, most of you know math is not my strong suit. I did great when I can memorize the multiplication tables. You know, because that's something I can memorize, spit it back out on a test. I did okay in Algebra 1. And then Algebra 2, and then when I got in Geometry, they want you to take these things, and the problem may last a page or two. You know, I I didn't do well in that. And I could kind of reason in my mind and come to an answer, but I can't tell you how I got there. Anybody else have that trouble? No, so we do have some math brainiacs in here. I was not one of those. He says in Paul's day, when they said, work out your salvation, it's like you're going into that gold mine. He says, you're going to work the mine, and you go into God's word, and you are working out all the valuable stuff in here. There are limitless nuggets in here. And it's wonderful when you discover a new one. You know, you're mining, you're digging and everything, and you see something you've never seen before. That's awesome. That's how we study. Or a field. Some of you like to garden and all that. That's not me either. Okay. Think of a field. Think of the field that you have out there. Do you do everything you can to get the greatest harvest possible? Yes, if you're a real farmer or something like that. So it's the same concept. You know, but I think of that mine, a miner. In fact, somebody sent me a miner's hat because they said you're always digging with a little light on it. Okay, so, but you're trying to get everything you can out of God's word, but you don't want to put in anything that isn't there. We're not to add to or take away, but show me these treasures. And I tell you, studying these last few years, it's like God keeps peeling back another layer of the onion. And you say, I never knew that. And then you begin to uh, connect scriptures that you've never been able to connect before. And it's wonderful. That's working out. Now, God has given all of us a great purpose. Achieve Christ-likeness. To be conformed to the image of his Son. There are problems in life, yes, but God will help us to work them out. Each of our lives has potential, tremendous potential, like a mine or a field. That mine just sitting there and nobody going in to get the ore out. Who's it helping? Nobody. The wealth is not being mined out of it. God wants to work in us to fulfill the potential that he's put in each one of us. 
So the key here to the journey of sanctification, I have a new life in Christ, and he's opened the door, he's given me everything I need so I can walk through after being justified, I walk through, and now he is going to do the process of sanctification in me. Lead me to a person, Jesus Christ, and his likeness. It is a long, progressive walk. And some days you feel like you're making a little progress, and then the next day, that's the way it is. And sometimes it's uphill and hard, and sometimes you kind of just stroll along, and it's a little bit easier. But it is not the same. It is a long, progressive journey. But the goal and the measure for all of us, has the blood been applied in your heart? Yes. So the goal for every one of us now is Christ's likeness. And he's the measure. He's the measure. Refuse to be seduced into defining spiritual maturity. Oh, my toes are going to get stepped on now. In terms of all your religious activity. Woo! Check off your boxes because of all your spiritual activity. Now, I was not raised Southern Baptist, and I've been Southern Baptist now since about 1980. But I remember these envelopes. Some of you probably remember these envelopes. Now, this would have appealed to me because I like to say, I did this, I did this, I did this, and check off my box. Yeah, you give yourself a grade. Okay, I found this, and this is from the Southern Baptist. Here's your envelope. You give your name what day it is, the class, the amount of your offering. Now, check each point and add up your grade. I cannot believe this. <laughs> See, this would have appealed to me. I'd have been right all over it. If you're here today, you get 20%. Oh, if you're on time, you get 10%. If you bring your Bible, you get another 10%. If you give an offering, you get 10%. If you've prepared your lesson, you get 30%. And then, do you stay for church? You get 20 more percent. Now, add up your grade, and this is how spiritual you are this week. Now, do what? Oh, yeah. And how many visits did you make? How many phone calls? You get a grade every week depending on these things. This sets people up for failure, I want to tell you. Because... I mean, somebody like me would have jumped all over this. You know, give me a list. You know, how many of you like to make lists and then cross off after you've done it? Okay. How many of you will admit that sometimes when you've made your list, you do something that wasn't on the list, but you go write it on the list so you can cross it off? <laughs> that is me. That was me. Just give me a list. I can, I've got it on paper, how spiritual I am. <laughs> Y'all know I'm teasing, right? <laughs> Christ-like character is the measuring stick of your growth and sanctification. Filling out that envelope has nothing to do with you becoming like Christ. I hope y'all see that. So, what is the primary instrument that God uses to sanctify us? It's the Word of God. He says, Father, sanctify them by your truth, because your Word is truth. I see you going for an envelope. I hope it does not have all that on there. <laughs> Mercy, I didn't even think about it, because I don't ever look at them. <laughs> Woo! Okay. Okay. God's Word trains us in righteousness so that we will be complete. Are we to grow up into Christ? Yes, that's our purpose. Okay, so this is a continuous process. I'm growing in holiness. Now, the word walk reminds me. Sanctification is not rolling effortlessly down a superhighway. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. No, it treks resolutely up a more arduous path, steadily progressing towards our goal. The walk of sanctification demands I've got to have a set purpose. I've got to make steady progress. There has to be strong perseverance. Where do I get perseverance? 
thank you, from the trials. We learn that in Hebrews. So we rejoice when these trials are coming because each trial that you respond to correctly, he's growing you, and it is giving you perseverance. And you've got to have perseverance in this race or the walk. You've got to have perseverance. As well as continual surrender. Every morning, you present yourself that daily sacrifice. I have a potter's wheel that Paula gave me right by my computer, and it reminds me every morning you get on the potter's wheel. You surrender to him and say, Father, whatever you need to change in me, to make me more into the image of Christ, I pray you'll do it today. I want to live more and more every day who I am in Christ. Okay. Now, this work of God, all my efforts are useless. There's no way you and I can act like Jesus. There's no way we can conform ourselves to the image of Christ. And he says, you've got to, you've got to come to the point that you realize you are helpless and you're hopeless to be obedient. So you surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit because the same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead lives in me. Think of the power that is within us to be obedient. It's the work of Christ on the cross, and it's the Holy Spirit's work in us. So Paul is going to emphasize the Holy Spirit's role. He's going to repeat these phrases in the book of Galatians. You live by the Spirit. You're sanctified by the Spirit. By the Spirit, you're able to put to death the deeds of the body. Mercy, if he can do all that in me, I'm told don't grieve him. I am told not to quench him because if I've got my vessels all clogged up with uh, unconfessed sin and I'm not in the word, I'm not being obedient, he cannot do all that. He has to have control of me. So it involves my cooperation and there's imperative commands that he gives. You've got to walk by the Spirit. You've got to live by the Spirit. You've got to keep in step with the Spirit. And you're just about to pull your hair out because you say, I can't do all that. And he says, I'm glad you realized it. That's what he did with me. I'm glad you realize this. You finally understand this. You cannot do this. So as I yield to the Holy Spirit, he provides the power so I can obey all these commands that are going to be given to the believer. He says in Colossians 3, 8, and 9, you are to put off everything Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. That's a lot to put off. And my old man can't do that. And the harder we try to do it, the more frustrated we get because we can't do it. Put on your new self. Because your new self is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Is it his desire to conform us to the image of his son? For the new man to be living in us? That's his desire. That's what he wants from each one of us. And he will do the work, but he needs us to submit to that. So he says, the Holy Spirit will enable me to keep steadily on my course without faltering or fainting in spite of all the opposition. By not giving place to the devil, that's one of our commands, and don't grieve the Spirit. But boy, when we come to the place and I say, God, I want to be obedient. I want all this in my life. And I agree with you, I cannot do it. That's where he wants us. When we realize that we can't. So we're going back to Ephesians 4, 1, and now we're going to see why therefore is there. I therefore beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, I've given you a chart just kind of summarizing chapters 1 through 3. Before, formally, you were afar off. That's what he's going to tell them. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were a slave to the world, the flesh and the devil. You were separated from Christ. You had no country, no covenant, no hope, no God, stranger, and alien. That's what you were. But now, after you've been brought near by the blood of Christ, 
You're alive with Christ. You're raised with Christ. You're seated in the heavenlies right now. Spiritually, you are there. Enmity has been abolished. You are a new man. You're reconciled to God. You're reconciled to one another. You're now a fellow citizen. You're a member of the family of God. You are the temple and the dwelling place of God himself. In Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul is going to spend three chapters detailing the wonders of God's grace. His matchless love, all the magnificent blessings that God wants to pour out on each follower of Jesus Christ. There's so much he wants to put on us, lavish upon us. He says, I'm going to enumerate these wonderful blessings that God lavishes on every person who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. Have you studied all of these graces that he's poured out on us? Most of us haven't. Here they are. You are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. He chose you to be holy and blameless before him. He predestined us in love for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Our adoption is to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us. In Christ I have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In Christ he has lavished on me all the riches of his grace with all wisdom and insight. In Christ he's made me know, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. It's a plan for the fullness of times to unite all things in Jesus Christ. In Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. In Christ I have hope. And those of us who hope in Christ do so to the praise of his glory. It glorifies him when we hope in him. We heard the gospel and we believed it. He said, when we believed it, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. If you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, you cannot be lost. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance till we obtain possession of it. I have an inheritance, and I think a lot of the problem with a lot of uh, people sitting in the pew, they don't know they have an inheritance, and if they do know they have one, they don't know what it is, and they don't know much about it. When you get a grasp of that, it will excite you, and you will be moved to obedience. He says, through the working of the grace of God, his active power, all these blessings and wealth are ours. His active power working in us to give us a new life. He gives us the faith that I need to believe. And he begins to slowly transform each one of us into the image of Jesus Christ. Paul says at the end of chapter 3, he's coming to a conclusion. Everything I've said is due to the active grace of God working in you by the Holy Spirit. He says, it's for the purpose of displaying for all eternity the awesome grace of God, so he will get all the praise and all the glory throughout eternity. Then Paul prays. He said, Father, will you open the eyes of their heart so they can comprehend the magnitude of God's grace? the magnitude of the power that's at work in them. I think we do not take advantage of the power that is within us. So, he comes to ask him a question, and I'm asking you. What was your condition before you were converted? He's going to tell them in chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. He goes on to say, you were enslaved to the worldview of people who don't even know God, and you were following them. You were enslaved to your own evil desires. You were enslaved to Satan. Your desire to know God and save yourself, you had no ability to do any of that. The grace of God. I love this passage in Ephesians 2. But God, because of his great mercy... His great love. He's made you alive together with Jesus Christ. 
and he has you sitting with Jesus Christ in the heavenlies. And he goes on in chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you're saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is a gift. The faith that you had to believe was a gift. It's all him. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And now at the end of Ephesians 3, Paul prays, By the grace of God, you'll be strengthened by the Holy Spirit in your inner man so that Christ can dwell in your heart through faith. He prays you'll get rooted and grounded in love and you'll have the strength to comprehend the fullness of God's love. This phrase jumped out at me. To know the fullness of God's love, it's a love that surpasses your knowledge. And that you will be filled with the fullness of God. And then he closes with a beautiful doxology to the God who's able to do far more abundantly than we even ask or think. Don't we kind of sell him short sometimes? He can do far more abundantly than we ask or think. He prays that God will be glorified in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout eternity. And then he says, therefore, because of everything I've just told you, now I urge you, I beseech you, that we will walk worthy of this vocation wherewith we have been called. It's interesting, J. Vernon McGee says, Paul calls himself a prisoner of the Lord. Because it's interesting, he's seated in the heavenlies. Is that right? We are seated in the heavenlies. Paul's seated in the heavenlies in Christ, but he's also seated in a prison because he has a witness for Christ to the Gentiles. Now, therefore, these are some statements from Ruth Paxson. She says, therefore does not indicate the commencement of something altogether new. We're not going to start a new thought. But therefore comes as a consequence of what he's already told you for three chapters. It is a call. Prove the reality of the wealth that you have because now you're going to have a right, worthy walk. This is how you show that you know that you have this. If you know this, and if you have apprehended it, and you grasp it, you will want to have the right, worthy walk. And it marks a transition from a positional truth. This is who you are. He told you for three chapters, and all the grace that's been lavished on you, now let's put it in practice. He says, the condition of a Christian has to harmonize with his position. Being in Christ now, I should desire to grow up into Christ. That is our purpose. It says, the wealth of the Christian should be manifest in your walk. If you're walking around as a defeated Christian and you're in fear and you're in despair and you're having doubts and envy and you've got a critical spirit and you have, you're being judgmental, you are not walking in your wealth. That's what, he's, that's what she's saying. In Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Your walk ought to reflect that you believe that. So she says, it is impossible to have a worthy walk without knowing the realities of the life that Christ has given you. Do you truly comprehend the life that Jesus Christ has given you with all of its wealth? See, most of us don't really quite comprehend all of that. Belief always precedes behavior. Your calling comes before your conduct or your behavior. Your position comes before you practice. Your wealth has to come. You've got to know it before you truly walk in the Spirit. The Christian is not, walk is not based on ignorance. It's based on knowledge. Because the better I understand Bible doctrine, the easier it is for me to obey the commands. Now, Ephesians 1 through 3, he's calling you to be. This is who you are. In Ephesians 4 through 6, he's going to call you, now, practice. This is the do part. 
So the key idea in Ephesians 1 to 3, sit down, believer, immerse yourself in chapters 1 through 3, and see and learn all the wealth that you have. Therefore, in chapters 4 through 6, now walk according to your wealth, according to who you are in Christ. Now, Ephesians contains 41 commands for the believer. 41. There are 40 commands for the believer in Christ in chapters 4, 5, and 6. This is the practical part. This is the doing part. And there's 40 commands that talk about your worthy walk of sanctification. There's only one command in the first part about doctrine. Y'all with me? Okay. Now, if I attempt to go do all those 40 commands without soaking in and savoring all the knowledge, all the doctrine that I'm supposed to be learning, my unfathomable riches, what do I do? I don't learn all this first. I go out and I start doing. See, that's what I did. And you will experience frustration and futility in your daily walk, and you may fall into the grace-killing trap of legalism. Do this, do this, go do, go do. Oh, that's the wrong. You get the, you cart, the cart before the horse. Is that right? Yeah. So, God's commands are always based on truths. I have given you the list in your notes there, the 40 commands that are in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to read through all of them for time's sake. Uh, we'll just do a few. I'll start at number one. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness. Walk with long-suffering, forbear one another in love. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Put off your old man that waxes corrupt after the lust of deceit. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on that new man that after God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Put away all falsehood. Speak truth with your neighbor. Be angry and sin not. Let him that stole labor, working with his hands, the thing that is good. Let what is good for edifying proceed out of your mouth. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted forgiving each other. Be followers of God as dear children. Walk in love, give thanks, walk as a child of light. Reprove the unfruitful works of darkness. Number 19, walk circumspectly. Redeem your time. How much time do we waste in a day for something that doesn't even matter for eternity? Be understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with the Spirit. And that is a present participle. You are constantly being filled. Because what happens? You grieve. You sin. You're beginning to get all clogged up. So you confess and ask to be filled again. Speak to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on. Now, when you see this, these are the commands that Paul writes to you and me. All of this, and we're to be obedient to them. And you are like me, I hope, you sit and you see this list and you are overwhelmed because we know we cannot do this. We can't be obedient to all of this. None of us can. So let's go on and see what he says. God's commands are always based on a truth that he has just revealed to you. See, that's happened in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now all the commands follow. The commands always call for the believer in Christ. You're going to have to continually depend on the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit who's working in your inner man. Otherwise, you can't obey any of this. So where am I always? On the potter's wheel. Letting him mold me and make me into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, when some people say, 
don't talk to me about doctrine. They think doctrine's dry and boring. I just want to go out and do the things I do. You know, my good works. I just want to go out and live my Christian life. According to Wearsby, they're revealing their ignorance of the way the Holy Spirit really works in our lives. When I begin to grasp my high calling, I'm ready to hear the exhortation to be holy as he is holy, to obey these commands. But if I don't know all that he has for me and what's waiting for me, all the grace that he wants to lavish upon us, just let me go live my life. Do you understand what Wearsby saying? He says, we cannot walk worthy of our calling unless I understand what my calling is, what it entails, and how it, in effect, energizes my walk. Francine, I'm calling you to be conformed to the image of Christ. I'm calling you to rule and reign with me in my kingdom. In Revelation 5, it says, I have made you a king and a priest. He wants us to be kings and priests in his kingdom. He's calling a bride to rule and reign with him. When you understand your calling, will it affect and energize your walk? Yes, you will want to be obedient. He said, there is a power, dunamis, that's where we get dynamite from that works, gives you the energy, it's present tense, it's continually working in me. If you don't have it, pray that he will put that in you. And you know what? He will, because it's his will. And he will. We must still make the choice to obey. We have to. But the Spirit is working in us, he gives you the desire. Many years ago, when all of this started with Laura, I prayed that God would give me a ravenous hunger for his word that could not be satisfied. That's a prayer he'll answer. The power of the word of God. Do you believe this word has power? Yes. It does. And this is a powerful chapter outlining the principles of unity, growth, and transformation in the Christian life. This is Ephesians 4. Now, in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, a lot of people don't want to read it. They don't want to study 1, 2, and 3 because it's all doctrine. But in 4, 5, and 6, he says, now we, I've told you all this good stuff. And he says, now in 4, 5, and 6, we're going to start talking about your walk. And he shifts to the practical. This is what God's giving you. This is his grace lavished on you. Now let's talk about how you walk. And he says, therefore, because of all this, this is how you should walk. It encourages us to embrace unity, utilize our spiritual gifts, and mature in our faith. The contrast between my old and my new self will challenge me to renew my mind and live as that new creation that I am. Paul gave his readers a marvelous revelation of their heavenly calling. You and I, I'm hoping next week to be able to uh, delve into a little bit of that heavenly calling in the millennial kingdom. Now, with equal clarity then, he's going to show you have a responsibility for, for corresponding conduct. If you know all of this, this should excite you and your walk should reveal that you understand this and you know about it. And your conduct should show it. Once again, he says, I therefore beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. The command to walk worthy of our calling doesn't mean that I am to somehow merit or earn my position. You cannot earn anything. He's exhorting believers to live their lives so as to prove I belong to Christ. You want to be obedient. There's two words for worthy. We're going to hit on this. The first one is Strong's 2661, cataxio, and it means to be counted worthy, to be deemed entirely deserving. I'm counted worthy because of what Christ has already done for me on the cross. He is the one that's worthy, and he made me worthy. That's only used four times in the Bible. And that is your justification. Okay? The other word is axios. It's used 41 times in the Bible. This is all about your sanctification and your walk. Worthy. 
to be worthy on the grounds that you're fit, you're meet, as the King James says, or you're qualified, you're suitable, you're getting prepared for the kingdom. Your walk is showing that you are preparing and walking in the way that he wants us to walk. So if you look at the screen, this is what Axios kind of uh, implies. Many people want to study doctrine, 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 but they don't ever put it into practice. Many people just want to go, do, 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 and you feed me a little doctrine so I know it. This is a worthy walk. It's a balance where you get into doctrine, you read your Bible, get a commentary if you need it, come to Bible study, dig into it. He says, I want you to have a balance. And he calls that a worthy walk, according to the Greek word here of worthy, axios. Now, James Boyce says, The intellectual believer faces a great danger, and often he has a great weakness as a result of failing to overcome this danger. He loves doctrine so much that he stops with doctrine. He reads Ephesians 1 through 3, and boy, is he excited. He just eats that up. He delights in it. And then he comes to Ephesians 4, and he says, oh, the rest is just about application. I know all about that. And he skips ahead and finds another doctrine section and neglects what he perhaps most needs to assimilate. Y'all follow that? And there are a lot of people that way. On the other hand, there are Christians primarily oriented to experience and doing. They thrive under the teaching found in Ephesians 4 through 6. Oh, I want to know about my spiritual gift. I want to know how to exercise my spiritual gift. They're excited about Paul's teaching about the family. This is where it's at for them. Oh, that doctrine section. Man, it's dry. This is not a worthy balance. You can never attach too much importance to doctrine. Because as you learn the doctrine and what he's got in his calling, your actions should spring out of that. You don't go do this not knowing that. That's what he's saying. At the same time, you can't attach too much importance to practice because it is the result of doctrine. Look at all the grace he's lavished on you. This should inspire you to the worthy walk. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, Paul is exhorting them always, you give equal weight, to, equal weight in your life to doctrine and practice. You've got to have a true balance. That's being worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Paul says in Philippians 1, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and I see you, or maybe I'm absent. I may hear of your affairs. I, you are standing fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Old sanctification is an ongoing process. You should be under that process until your last breath, and you are growing in holiness and lightness of Jesus Christ. Conduct is the word peripateo, and it means it, some translations will say your behavior, some say your conversation. But it means you go about or you walk around by walking in the Spirit. That's how we're to be walking, in the Spirit. But it's the present imperative tense because you're continually depending on the Holy Spirit every waking hour. You're depending on Him for your walk to be worthy and do the work in you. So here is another one that uh, one of the commentators said, you're on the potter's wheel and you're, you have a balance of your conduct and a balance of doctrine. So a lot of people just want to go work, 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 but they don't have a much of a relationship. That's the way I used to be. Working, 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 doing, 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 but not a whole lot of time here in doctrine. My conduct springs out of the truth that I know. If you truly believe 
that he has positions of authority, he has crowns, he has rewards, he has all of these things for us, and he has a thousand year of a kingdom coming here on earth, and he wants you to rule and reign with him in some capacity. If you truly believe it, your walk should show it. Paul exhorts the believers to live their lives like who they are, a citizen of heaven. So their conduct, in a sense, weighs as much as the gospel that they profess and the faith that, that they preach and the faith they profess. We are to practice what we preach. Our experience should measure up to a new standing. Are you a child of the king? And the king has great plans for you. We do not behave a certain way to go to heaven. This is nothing about us being able to go to heaven. You have a holy calling. He wants a holy walk. And you say, I can't. He knows that. That's why he's given you the Holy Spirit to do the work in you and through you so that you will be, have a worthy walk. So the concept of a Christian's walk that matches our Christian talk is reiterated in Ephesians chapters 4, 5, and 6. Be an imitator of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. And he gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. He says, at one time you were in darkness. Colossians 1 said, Give thanks that he delivered you out of the kingdom of darkness and translated you into the kingdom of his dear son. He says, Now you are light in the Lord. Walk as a child of light. The fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. He says in Ephesians 5, 15, Pay careful attention then to how you walk. Don't walk as an unwise person, but as wise Make the most of the time that you have, because the days are evil. Ruth Paxson says, a walk implies purpose. You're starting for a goal. You're to make progress, steadily advancing step by step. You need perseverance, and you keep on until that goal is reached. In Ephesians 1.4, it tells us the starting point of the journey God already determined the starting point, its goal, and the road over which your walk is to be made. Ephesians 1.4, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish before Him in love. The goal of my walk, Ephesians 5.27, He wants to present to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And how is this to happen? Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit, continually filled with the Spirit. That's the means whereby his goal will be completed. In 1 John 2.6, it says, he who says he abides in him, do you abide in Christ? We say that. But then you, it says, ought himself also to walk just like Jesus walked. From whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So the real question for you and me today, will I make a daily choice to walk in the wealth which he has freely bestowed on us in the Beloved? If I am in Christ, I have access to unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ. I have an inheritance in Jesus Christ that none of us really comprehend yet. But the veil is going to be lifted someday. And people that, aren't, that don't know about it, aren't living for that, I believe that's where some tears of regret are going to come. He told Joshua in Joshua 1.3, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, that have I given to you. Just like I said to Moses, he's going into the inheritance in the promised land, which I believe is a type of, a picture of our abundant life. Because they had enemies in there, they were going to have bloodshed, they're going to do war, and they have to overcome all these enemies. Every enemy in that land is a type of something in our flesh that has to be defeated. 
like fear and envy and jealousy, all those things. But tread, if not, you just go step on it and I give it to you. Tread in Hebrew is derock, and it's warfare. You are going to have to do warfare, spiritual warfare and prayer over having victory over the things in your life. Joshua had to walk worthy of his calling as a commander so Israel could actually possess what was theirs. That's what you and I have to do. You and I, do. we have things we already have in Christ. Yes, but we're going to have to do warfare, surrender, get on the potter's wheel, etc., spiritual warfare, and actually to possess what's already ours, just like Joshua did. Believers have something far better than a promised lamb. I have a promised life. <laughs> I have eternal life. I have looking forward to being a king or a priest, some kind of uh, thing in his, uh, a position in his kingdom. I have something far better. But he said, it's going to take warfare in my life right now. Paul, therefore, is begging, present tense, saints to walk forth on and in these promises, and in so doing, they will be walking worthy of the calling with which they have been called. And just like he promised Joshua, I'm not going to leave you. I won't forsake you. Now, not only is he worthy, excuse me, not only is he with us as we walk worthy, but his spirit is in me. It providing the power to that inner man. There's a power so that I can walk according to the power that works within me. There is a power that energizes me. I'm ending with my favorite passage. Here's the desire that you could pray for yourself. Prodigals. That you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that I would walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, be fruitful in every good work, and increase in the knowledge of God. He goes on to say that I would be strengthened with all might according to that glorious power that works within me unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. So you walk in a manner worthy, worthy of our calling, worthy of God, worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. People should be seeing fruit being born in your life, and you can't produce the fruit yourself. It's the Holy Spirit that will produce the fruit in you. They should see you increasing in understanding. And then it ends with 11 and 12. You will be strengthened with all might according to a glorious power that works within you, and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, you're going to give thanks to God the Father. He's the one that will qualify you to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Why would I not put myself in His hands? He's the one that will make me qualified to get the inheritance. Yes, and the Greek word is hikanuo, and it means He's the one that will make you sufficient. He will qualify you and equip you with adequate power so you are prepared to receive your inheritance. Fruitful in every good work. A worthy walk, we see, has four characteristics. Fruitful in every good work. Steadily increasing in the knowledge of God. Using the power of God to joyfully endure and patiently persevere. Give thanks to the Father for what He's done. The Christian life, ladies, is one step of faith. That's, that's how it started, that one step. But it's going to be many more progressive steps of faith that you will need to take as you make progress. If I do not learn to walk worthy now, I'll never be able to run the race. I'll never be able to stand in the battle. Paul urges us to walk worthy of the vocation to which we have been called. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word again. We thank you for the way that you work in us and through us. And I pray that the truths of this lesson, Lord, we will take them to heart and seek you, seek your face this week and see if we are walking a work worthy. And if not, Impress upon us what we need to do so that we will be obedient to these commands. Help us to really uh, meditate on the grace that you have lavished on us, what you have for us, our inheritance. 
And, oh, God, may that be a springboard for us to desire to have a worthy walk. We give you the praise for the Holy Spirit who works in us to make that happen. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.